Toronto uh, so early. <laughs> um, and as, as I had mentioned, I, my name is Fatima. I am uh, one of the alumni of the Concordia Forum. And I'm truly humbled to be moderating today's session on an existential approach to understanding the Quran. Um, today, we are featuring an incredible thinker, lecturer, and writer, Sheikh Arif Abdul Hussein of Birmingham, UK, uh, where he will help us critique our basic assumptions of the Quran through an existential approach. Uh, this is a timely topic, given that it is the blessed month of Ramadan, and we are still in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, where in both cases, uh, people are seeking ways to improve themselves and the world around us. And in times like these, we do turn to our glorious book for guidance. So inshallah, in today's session, we will discuss the interpretation of the blessed Quran, not just through intuitive understanding, but inshallah, through sharp reasoning. Uh, by way of brief background, uh, Sheikh Arif Abdul Hussein founded the Al Mehdi Institute in 1993 in Birmingham, UK, and currently serves as its director and senior lecturer in Usul al Fiqh and Muslim philosophy. Uh, for over 20 years, Sheikh Arif has been at the forefront of developing and delivering advanced Islamic studies tailored toward training students capable of addressing the needs of contemporary societies. Um, for many years, he has been committed to sharing the human face of Islam at various levels of society through a combination of inspiritual, inspirational and thought-provoking lectures together with a commitment to intra and interfaith dialogue. Sheikh Arif, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, it's truly an honor to have you here with us. So what I'd like to do with your permission, Sheikh, uh, is to ask you a few questions on this topic and then inshallah open up the floor to questions from the participants who have joined today. Um, so my first question to you is, uh, for the benefit of everyone listening today, we want to hear from you what your concept of existential approach would be in interpreting the Quran. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, thank you for having me on your program. I'm truly humbled and honored and given the and been given the opportunity to share some of my um, thoughts. Now the, the existential approach, what I mean by it very simply is that the nature to which God has created the world is a yardstick to interpret the word of God. Even if God is a transcendent being, according to, let's say, many of our theologians, yet the very fact that God can conceive of a world which is temporal, evolutionary, which has variety and relativity inside it, shows the fact that he has conceived of such a world, that his nature is reflected in that world to an extent. And the fact that he has spoken within a temporal world, which is a world of growth and relativity, shows that this notion of evolutionary growth and relativity can be the hermeneutical keys towards understanding his communication. And that is, in a nutshell, what I mean uh, as the existential approach. Okay, thank you. Now, based <laughs> on the existential approach, um, I understand you are going to critique the basic assumptions that are held around the nature of the Quran. Um, one of the assumptions we have is that the Quran is all comprehensive and it consists everything within it. How do we now understand this through the existential framework and how does this then tie up with previous scriptures? So th thank you very much. It's an all pressing question here. As Muslims, we have this notion that the Quran consists of everything. We have these sort of verses that there is nothing dry or wet, nor leaf, leaf falls from the tree, but that it is within the apparent book. So here what we have is that when we read the Quran, we come to a variety of designations in the Quran, such as Al-Quran, Al-Dhikr, Al-Kitab, Kitab al-Mubin, Umm al-Kitab. We look at all these different designations and we say they're all talking about the same thing. And if you were to have that assumption, then you would say, yes, the Quran does have everything inside it because the verse says, there is nothing that is dry or wet. No leaf descends from the branch of the tree, but that it is recorded within the apparent book. 
And for us, that apparent book is the Quran and hence everything is within the Quran. Now I'll ask you a simple question. <clears throat> if we can put away our faith to one side in our assumptions, is the kangaroo in the Quran? Is the banana mentioned inside the Quran? Is a spaceship spoken of in the Quran? Is space travel spoken of in the Quran? Now I know the Muslim would struggle with such questions that they would say, well, <clears throat> It is possibly all there, but in a fashion that we don't understand, ambiguously embedded within the verses of the Quran. If that is the case, then we will take another approach. <clears throat> and we will say, okay, the Quran calls itself Al-Kitab. Now, if you look at the verses, the verses state that we gave Kitab to Moses. We gave the Kitab to Jesus. We gave the kitab to you, O Muhammad. And of course, in Surah Juma, we have, I sent them a messenger from amongst themselves, who teaches them the book. So if all three of these prophets have been given the kitab, then the kitab seems to be a reality beyond the Quran that we have at present. In fact, it seems that the Qur'an is an extension of the Kitab. Kitab is another reality altogether. Take the other verse. يَمْحُ اللَّهُ مَا يَشَا وَيُثْبِتْ وَعِنْدُهُ أُمُّ الْكِتَاب Allah wipes clean whatever He wishes and He establishes whatever He wishes. And He has the mother of all books. According to the existential principles, the book is an existential reality which consists of everything inside it. From time to time, it is being reflected as revelation in different forms, such as Torah, Injil, and the Quran. Now, let us look at these verses carefully. In Surah Waqtia, we have this verse, Innahu la Quranun Karim fi kitabin maknun. It is the noble Quran within a concealed book. Then again, we have another verse. Bal huwa Qur'anun majidun fi lawhin mahfoob in Surah Buruj. Rather, it is the majestic Qur'an in the sacred, contained within the sacred tablet. If you look here, the reference is made to the book and Qur'an separately. Now, even if that is not clear, we can go to another verse and another set of verses and they're scattered everywhere within the Quran. <clears throat> if you look at Surah Fussilat, it says, Kitabun Fussilat Ayatuhu Quranan Arabiyan, a book whose verses have been set apart as an Arabic Quran. So book is one thing, Arabic Quran is a reflection of that book or an extension of that book. The book is an existential reality consisting of everything. Then again, we have another verse. Hamim wal kitabil mubin. Hamim and the apparent book. Now look at what comes after. Inna ja'alnahu Quranan Arabiyan. We have made it into an Arabic Quran. So Kitabul Mubin, that has everything that is dry, everything that is wet, no leaf descends from a branch, but that it is recorded within the Kitabul Mubin. That Kitabul Mubin has been made into an Arabic Quran. So we are seeing here a distinction between Kitab and Kitabul Mubin, Ummul Kitab and the Quran. If you look at the verses of the Quran, and there are many, many, many. We gave Jesus, Lord Jesus, the book, the Torah, and the Injil. So book is a different entity. And the Torah and the Injil. If you look at the Quran carefully and study the verses, you will see that no. Kitab ul mubin Umul Kitab, these are overwhelming truths, existential, which are then reflected 
in differing regions to different people in their language appropriate to them. Such an analysis will say that the Arabic language is not an essential feature of the Quran. The Quran is beyond the Arabic language. The Quran is reflection of an overwhelming reality. Now, if we were to just conclude this particular small discussion and say, وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ وَمَا أُنزِلَ مِنْ public. The description of the believers in Surah Baqarah when the Prophet arrives in Medina and faces a pluralistic community. The Prophet does not antagonize them. Rather, it states to the Abrahamic community there that the definition of a God-conscious person is the one who brings faith in everything revealed unto you, O Muhammad, and everything revealed before you. Now, if I were to admit to myself that I believe in everything re revealed before my revelation, that shows that there is, in essence, no difference between what was revealed previously and what is being revealed now. The difference is only in the cosmetic parts of the language, the sort of examples that are used, the sort of formulations that are given. But in essence, is one reality. And that one reality that is being revealed is the reality of the Kitab al Mubin or the book or whatever other reference point the Quran gives. So that is uh, what I would say about the Quran and the comprehensive nature of the Quran. No, does not have everything inside it. The Ummul Kitab or the Kitab al Mubin has everything inside it. Now, if you look at this. Uh, Verse, la Quranun Karim fi Kitabin Maknun. It is the noble Quran within the secret book. La yamassuhu illa al-mutahharun. None may approach it or touch it, save the purified ones. Now the legions have understood this verse to mean that you can't touch the words of the Quran without having physical ablutions and purity. Of course, when this verse was revealed in itself, there was no notion of doing physical ablutions to touch the Quran. Yes, there was a notion of physical ablutions given to the Prophet by Gabriel before you pray the daily prayers. But this notion of touching the Quran without ablution wasn't there at that point. So here, as our grand Mufassirin have speculated, such as Tabatabai, this Purity means the purity of the mind and the soul, so that the ambiguity of the Quran can be unraveled by the people who are endowed and they can reach through the Quran, they can reach like overwhelming existential reality. So the Quran directly does not have everything inside it, it's Kitabul Mubin, and Quran is a reflection of that in an ambiguous form at times, in a clear form at times in a very practical, pragmatic form at times, but it does not consist of everything within it at face value. <clears throat> That's such a beautiful explanation. Thank you for that. Now, Sheikh, we have this notion that the Quran is eternal and applicable at all times and regions. So how do you reconcile this idea with your evolutionary existential approach? Um, and the fact that the human society is always on um, and requiring newer form to accommodate their evolution. So the real thing when we say that the Quran is eternal, the real thing that the legists mean is that the application of the Quran is eternal. You see, if the Quran is the word of God, God is eternal. If it is a final revelation, there is finality to it. Then that means it is an absolute binding communication. The way God speaks to us is in a language that we understand. And therefore, the words of God are to be appreciated at face value. If we put all of that together, it brings in the consequence, which is that the Quran is applicable literally till the end of human existence on the face of this earth which then means that women get half the share of inheritance. Men have this predominance over women ordained by the Quran. We take slavery, <clears throat> we take slaves, we have concubines, we have female inferiority 
male superiority in witnessing and in the roles assigned to each of the two genders. So we come out with notions that intuitively we can't swallow. We know that, that slavery doesn't make sense, but the Quran has not abrogated it or abolished it. We know that all right hand ownership doesn't make sense. We know that in regions where women are not only carers, but are also providers, it doesn't make sense that they have half the share of inheritance and males have twice the share of inheritance. So here is a problem that we have in our minds. And I'm just going to give a little bit more to it, uh, problematize this particular issue before we go into it. We were advising the G7 uh, sort of summit. And we were faced with the problem of <clears throat> minority rights within Muslim countries. Now, we know the law of jizya within the Quran Surah Toba. That you take jizya from the Christians and the Jews. And the non-Abrahamic faiths, we cannot even keep, give them a status of citizen within the Islamic State, unless, of course, we make huge modifications. So we were trying to bring about a notion that no, citizenship gives everybody equal rights. Now, how do we reconcile that with the Muslim theology and the Quranic teachings? Of course, it was a difficult task, so we resorted to the charter or the, 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 the charter of Medina that the Prophet constructed upon his arrival into Medina and tried to resolve it from there. But the interesting point is that intuitively we know that as a citizen of a state, everybody enjoys the same rights, privileges, and laws. And there is no distinction. Yet the theology does not allow for it. And there you go, intuitively you feel something is right, and theologically it is said to you that it is wrong. How do you reconcile? So the eternity of the Quran and universal applicability of the Quran poses a huge problem within the contemporary Muslim mind. Existentially, it's not a problem at all. What do we mean by the word of Quran being eternal? Quran, first and foremost, as a description of the Quran, it's divine communication within a human context. Human context is not eternal. It's a temporal context. It is always changing, moving on. So the eternal part of the Quran is the essence of the Quran. The temporal part of the Quran is the formulation of that eternal truth within a temporal context. Now let us work into it a little bit more. From the last discussion we had, we have three successive revelations, Torah, Injil, Quran, that confirm each other's validity. What has changed in these three successive revelations? Did the theology change in the sense of there is one God? Did God-human relationship change that we are supposed to be obedient to God? Did the soteriology change that salvation comes through believing in God and performance of righteous deeds? Did the notion of virtue change that virtuous state means be truthful, reliant upon God, caring, sharing, loving, forgiving, charitable? Did spiritual morality change that do good work for the sake of God? We are finding none of these things has changed. The only thing was it was packaged in one language and then it was packaged in another language. Did the history that the Quran consists of, that the Torah consisted of, did the history change? The prophetic history has not changed, it's a matter of fact. When you look at the Quran, it has cosmology. Cosmology is a matter of fact. We will verify it, if not today, in a future world, we will verify the cosmology of the Quran. For example, we've just been able to verify a verse of the Quran in the last few decades. The heavens we have constructed 
worked with hands and we are constantly expanding them. That can't change, it's a matter of fact. Does embryology change? The way the human fetus is created in fashion, it doesn't change, it's a matter of fact. We are seeing that all of these are eternal facets of the Quran, packaged within a particular language and appropriate examples. But at the same time, there is a facet of the Quran that is not eternal at all. And that is what the context I want to make build on two points. The Quran is prophet centric. The wives of the prophet are not here. They are being spoken of in the Quran. How can that be eternal? Abu Lahab, the uncle of the prophet who is condemned by the Quran is no longer here. Zayd, the adopted son of the prophet is no longer here. The battle of Ohad, the battle of Badr, these things are not eternal at all. The language is not eternal. The examples given by the Quran are not eternal because those examples befitted those people. The knowledge base of the Arabs restricted the communication of the Quran because the Quran could not speak in unrestrictedly. It had to have a pragmatic appeal so that they understand. These are not the eternal parts of the Quran at all. But going on, and coming to the most important part is that Quran speaks of application of justice as a societal norm, absolute norm. However, the Quran does not insist upon what is just. It does formulate what is just in its own context because of the pragmatic nature of the Quran. What do we mean here? We have this broad notion of justice. What is justice? Justice is me giving everything its rightful due. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the definition of justice only says one thing. In Allah is not oppressive to the people. He does not give affirmative definition of justice. He just tells us what is not just. And there's a reason there. Because the human community is an evolutionary reality. We are always moving on. Our aptitudes are always changing. And as our aptitudes change, the system of rights also changes. Let's give an example. A couple of decades ago, giving a female less wage than a male for doing the same task was acceptable. Today, it is seen as unjust. If there was a standard for justice, it would have been unjust two decades ago. It is only with the growth of human nobility, human aptitude, that today, not having equal pay has become problematic. A century ago, for a woman not to have the right to divorce was not unjust. Today, it is unjust. So God does not stipulate what is just beyond his own context. God just says, uphold justice. But justice is always fluctuating from era to era, from time to time. With that in mind, it's an existential property. With that in mind, when the Quran says that summon two main witnesses, if you are out on travel and you want to transact or give a loan and if you cannot find two male witnesses then find one male and two female so that if one forgets the other one can remind her now we have taken that as an eternal law of the quran but the quran is being very pragmatic in giving this law it is saying that the aptitude of women at this point is such that they are not accustomed to retaining knowledge. One woman is fine, but if she forgets, then the other one can remind her. But if you come to a time where a woman does not forget and can bear accurate, accurate testimonials and retain knowledge, then there is no need for another one because her existential potential and aptitude 
has been actualized. Back in the day, within the warring sort of culture of the Arabs, the women were left uneducated, untrained. So even the Quran is giving the essence there, that the essence is accurate testimonials. But given that the society is this strong and this weak, God apportions it in that way. So the law of just law is not what the Quran is saying there. That is not eternal at all. That is the Quran at a pragmatic level giving us how justice is to be applied in your context. Similarly, women cannot divorce. This is not eternal. Or that the verse that men have qiwama, some type of superiority over women. But the verse says بِمَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ بَعْضُهُمْ عَلَى بَعْضُ In accordance with what God has blessed some over others. Now this blessing is an existential property. It increases and decreases. Back in the day, it was a warring community. The man had the strength. I'm just giving one interpretation. And could go and defeat the enemy. He was the breadwinner. In today's world, the thing is very different. What if in future, there are no wars, or if there are wars, they are conducted by drones, and the women have the best ability in their imaginative capacities to control the drones, and obviously, they have a greater grace than men have. So these rights are in accordance with existential aptitudes. Same with inheritance, or the blood money, but the inheritance is within the Quran that the male get, gets two shares of the inheritance and female gets one share. But that is obviously due to the social roles assigned to each in that societal setup. That the man is a provider, woman is a carer. Now, wherever a man is a provider, woman is a carer, I agree. That sort of distribution of inheritance would work. But in the Western hemisphere, in the what we call the, obviously in Europe and America, and other such regions where women are providers and are carers, it is unjust for a woman to receive half the share of inheritance in comparison to a man. So the Quran talks about a just system of according rights. But justice that the Quran gives in the verses is in accordance with the aptitude of its own community. And the notion of justice and just is contingent to the existential aptitudes that are always changing. And therefore, that part of the Quran, the societal laws are not eternal at all. So, decapitation of limbs, public flogging, beating women, divorce, inheritance, right hand, ownership, slavery, these are societal norms and laws. These are based on notion of justice, human morality, dignity that is always evolving, exists potentially. These are not at all stagnant or eternal. What is eternal are the ethoses that they carry. And the Quranic verses have the ethoses, as we said, that if one woman forgets, let the other one remind her. Obviously, I would like to make an exclusion to the devotional aspects and the consumables that the Quran talks about and the laws of decency. But even if you look at the devotional aspects that the Quran gives, there is no eternity to any form of namaz or fasting or hajj. There isn't. You go to a region where sun does not rise or sun does not set. The daytime is no longer understood in terms of daylight hours. That was their immediate context of the Arabian community. You go to the northern regions of Europe, <coughs> the day is 22 hours, 23 hours. Sometimes the night extends to 20, 21 hours. There is no value in fasting for three hours, and it is counterproductive to fast for 20 hours. So that, that was the context in which that eternal sort of facet belonging to the human nature that 
fasts have been prescribed for you as they were prescribed on those before you so that you may become God mindful. The verse does not say, a dear friend of mine says, so that you may die out of hunger, so that you may become God mindful. So God mindfulness, and look at today's intermittent fasts. The human mind is getting there anyway as well. So now the Quran talks about the essence of fasting, that when you are fleeing, then pray on horseback or running. When you're on horseback or running, there is no qibla, there is no ruku, there is no sujood. The Quran itself is saying that the essence <coughs> of being spiritually connected with God in a context is to do with direction as an identity need. Is to do with ruku and sujood as all the prophets have performed. But if you're up in space, you will be tumbling over trying to do ruku and sujood. On the moon, you will be levitating. So if the future human takes to space, where the year is not 360 degrees and there is no Kaaba, the spiritual God-centric connection will still be there. It will require some form. That form will be contingent to the context in which the future human finds itself. I'll just give one of the hadiths from the eschatological literature. It says towards the end of time when the Mahdi and the Dajjal come, this is from the Muslim literature, the broad Muslim literature, uh, all the sects agree to it, that each year will become as long as seven years. Now, how many times will Ramadan come in that year? And how many times will Hajj will become, become Wajib? And the days will slow down, so how many prayers will we be praying? Can you see this? If the day becomes <clears throat> 36 hours long, are we still playing, praying five times? Whereas the Quran is saying in the Salat, Kanat al Mu'minina Kitaban Mawkuta, that the prayer is a time specific obligation upon the people so that you may remember God constantly, not at sunrise, sunset, when sunrise and sunset are two hours apart or are 22 hours apart. And you have to then rush to get in Maghrib, Isha, and Subu within two hours, as people do in northern regions of Europe. So, no, eternity of the Quran is in the theology of the Quran in terms of the notion of God. God's centricity, human virtues, eschatology, in the sense of soteriology, those are the eternal parts of the Quran. Unchangeable parts of the Quran is the history, the cosmology, the scientific things, but what is very much contingent to the human community and its state of growth and progress and evolution are the systems of rights and the forms that the oceans take. Thank you, Sheikh. You've unpacked so many assumptions for me personally. That was really, really mind blowing. Appreciate it. Um, I mean, given that we're uh, unraveling some of these fundamental assumptions, uh, there's one I'd like to ask you about the Quran as a miracle. Um, how do you understand its miraculous nature? Yes, thank you. It's such, such, such a wonderful uh, question. I. I, I, I will recall to mind the deliberations of Marhum, <clears throat> Dr. Hadi Fadli. Maybe some of the best deliberations on this particular issue. When he talks about miracle in, in line with obviously the previous theologians, miracle is something that makes us incapable of responding. And as a consequence to accept that that thing that we have just witnessed is from a superior source. So for example, when Moses throws the staff and God calls it a sign, the magicians see something extraordinary. They see that this staff has consumed their robes. And when Moses picks it up, it resumes its former shape. There is no increase in visible mass or decrease or change in the staff. Here, they are logically challenged and baffled. And they said, this is way beyond human base of knowledge at its peak. And therefore, they immediately fall into prostration. And they said, we bring faith in the God of Moses and Aaron. So miracle has to have the property of being able to challenge the mind of the people that it is addressing. Miracle cannot be out of sync. So Moses could not have brought the Quran because it's in Arabic. They don't understand Arabic. The magicians will say, well, what are you going on about? He could not have blowed 
spirit into that body they would say well, this is a different type of a miracle we're talking about this type of a miracle so miracle or you know bill gates could not have brought the computer and virtual sort of gadgetry to the arabian community they would have just stored him to that thinking is a witch or something so miracles have to be in line with the knowledge base of the people that are being challenged then what is the purpose of the miracle it is so that these minds admit that whatever this thing is that has been brought about it is way beyond the peak of our learning and hence they conclude that it is from a superior source that is the immediate effect that the miracle is supposed to have what is the objective thereafter of the miracle fadli puts this very accurately he says the objective is to invite people to the communication of the superior source he says it stands to reason that the most the staff of moses only had value in stirring the minds he did not have any more value the real value was for the torah and the message of the torah and what the prophet was saying about the message of deliverance that was the real message turn to god be god centric lead a virtuous life and find salvation that was the message be just but the staff lost its efficacy totally he said even if you were to find the staff today in a museum it won't make much difference it's just a staff what makes a difference is the message of moses within the torah not the staff so the miracle first and foremost it baffles the minds and secondly is an invitation well if the source of this particular supernatural event supernatural is not been unnatural it means working of nature at a level that we cannot comprehend which does not mean we cannot do it in a future world we will be able to throw staffs and make them into serpents as we evolve we will become the hand of moses inshallah when we get there but the purpose of miracle is to challenge the minds and then to invite the mind to the message of that supreme source now in the case of the quran the believers have this assumption that the quran is a miracle obviously they believe it's a miracle but i want to ask them a thing when you put the quran on your head does it fill your head with knowledge it's an amazing thing i see the muslim community and i myself do this by the way we put the quran on our heads and we implore god but the thing is you go to the university I hope my sarcasm doesn't get me into trouble. You go to the university and your textbooks that you're supposed to read. If you put it on your head, do you think you're going to pass the exam? You're supposed to read it. You're supposed to reflect upon it, contemplate it, and learn from it. So I'm saying to the, to myself, when I put the Quran on my head, does it fill my head with knowledge? No. When I put it to a hungry stomach, does it fill fill the stomach? No. when i put it over the head of somebody who is without shelter does it provide them with shelter no when i put it to the heart of a grieving mother does it fill her with comfort does it touch her with a godly touch of love and care no so where is the miracle of the quran so here now <clears throat> we will say that the quran is a unique thing it's a miracle and the communication both in one as opposed to staff and torah that were two this is one the miracle and communication are one and the same so how can the communication be miracle previously we thought it was the beautiful eloquence of the quran but we said one of the properties of a miracle is that you can challenge it only the masters of arabic eloquence could have challenged the quran we are in no position to challenge the quran Quranic eloquence, because when the Blessed Prophet had the smallest surah written and pinned to the wall of the Kaaba, the greatest poet said, "Inna atina kal kothra fi walla ma hada kalamul bashar." By God, this is not the word of man; it is from a different source altogether. He conceded, but I don't have the appreciation of Arabic language to that level. None of the Arabs have it anymore. That level of appreciation of eloquence has been lost. So, what is the challenge of the Quran? what is the miraculousness of the quran it is in its meaning 
embedded within its meaning. Now the Quran says, if you were to check this Quran, you will find no discrepancies therein. Amazing thing is that the Muslim assumes there are no discrepancies, but never goes out to look for discrepancies. If we could go out and look for discrepancies within the Quran and failing to find them, we conclude that there are no discrepancies, maybe we will open up to the miraculous nature of the Quran. The Quran is phenomenal. Like it is beyond anything I have read. The sequences of the verses, the endings of the verses, a verse the Blessed Prophet recites at the beginning of his missionary role, and one in the middle and one at the end. And when you compare the three, there is full consistency. How could he have retained that? Let me give one or two examples. Allah says in the Quran, and we took you out of the wombs of your mother. We gave you hearing, seeing, and thinking. Little is the thanks that you give. Now, if you look at this, analyze this medically, the fetus starts hearing first. Then the baby starts seeing. And then we compare knowledge and start thinking. It's phenomenal. And there is consistency in this verse again and again. Even the sequence of this verse is extremely meaningful. Look at the embryology of the Quran. Look at the fact that it says, We created the heavens with hands and we are expanding it. And we made from water everything living. Look at these verses, they are mind blowing. When you look into the Quran critically, you will say, Wow, it cannot be but from a very superior, superior source. Similarly, when you look at these verses, Isa says to his community, I'm going to fashion for you a bird and breathe into it and it will become a bird. I will breathe into the dead and by the consent of God, it will become living. I will cure the lepers and the blind. After many surahs, God speaks to Isa. And God says, oh Isa, do you remember when you fashioned the form of a bird and you breathed into it and by my consent it became a bird? And when you breathed into the dead bodies and by my consent, they became alive. And when you cured people of leprosy and blindness by my consent, look at the sequence there. And after a few surahs, the sequence is there. The only thing that is changed is the speaker. Here when Isa said it, here when God says. It is phenomenally, it is phenomenally and meticulously accurate. And then look at every prophet, no matter which prophet is talking. They will often use the word Fatir as Samawati about God. Not the Khalik, but Fatir, the one who Fatara takes apart the heavens and the earth. It's phenomenal. So when you challenge the Quranic meaning, that's when you understand that it's a miracle, it actually challenges the mind. And when it challenges the mind, that's when you say, Ah, I have something to learn from it. Otherwise, the complacent Muslim mind is, oh, it's a miracle. Well, how is it a miracle? It has to challenge the mind before the mind can commit itself to it. And then the growth process and nurturing process begins with the Quran. Bibi Aisha was asked, who nurtured the Prophet? Bibi Aisha said, the Quran nurtured the Prophet. Incredible. Uh, I, I wish we had more time for this topic. I feel like there's so much still to unpack and discuss. Um, you mentioned uh, the, the voice uh, who was speaking in the Quran, that uh, Isa was speaking at one point, and then God was speaking. Uh, and that actually brings me to my last question before we open up the floor for questions from others, is that um, we've always been taught that the Quran is the word of God. Do you understand that it is the word of God, and is God communicating to us through the Quran? Since we want to leave some time for um, questions, um, I'll, I'll take this one very, very quickly. Uh, this is another one of our naive assumptions. Something being ordained by God is not, not the same as spoken by God. So if you look at the verses of Surah Baqarah, when you talk about, when we look at the creation of Adam, the verses were, إِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ And when your Lord said to the angels, who is talking here, God or Jibreel? Hazrat Jibrail is speaking here, O Muhammad, and when your God said to the angels, think about this, or in places where we have the verse saying, Imma nuriyannaka ba'adu ma na'iduhum, aw natawakwayannaka min qabal, O Muhammad, either we will show you 
what we have promised to do to these disbelievers, or we will kill you before that. God does not have this ambivalent sort of a mindset. God knows what he's doing. Why is there this ambivalence? What is the agency communicating it? Then another surah that says, uh, it's everywhere, I'm just giving a few selected examples, about Qarun in Surah Qasas, وَخَسَفْنَا بِهِ وَبِدَارِهِ الْعَرْضُ وَمَا كَانَ لَهُ مِنْ فِئَةٍ يَنْسُرُونَهُ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ and we swallowed his house and him up in the earth. And there was no group that could have assisted him except for Allah. Allah doesn't speak like that. Allah would say, except for me. Can you see that? And in other places, Allah says to Moses, Inni an Allah. Indeed, I am Allah. Here Allah is speaking directly. Then you have this different points of reference in the Quran. Huwa, he, kullu, huwa, say he. Or I. Or we. What is happening here? It's a phenomenal thing. Even when God is speaking, there is no uniformity. On the one hand, Allah describes himself. He is the first. He is the last. He is the apparent. He is the hidden. He says, He is with you wherever you may be. Wherever you turn, there you will find the face of God. It's an overwhelmingly ubiquitous God that is present everywhere. Nothing is like him. There is no example like him. And on the other hand, he has a casual conversation with the Iblis. And displays human emotions. How dare you talk like this? Get out from here. Upon you is my curse till the end of day. Drop from it. I will fill the hell with you and all of them together. So on the one hand, you're fighting a God that is displaying human-like qualities. On the other hand, it's a transcendent God. And then you have the imminent God. It's phenomenal. The variations that the Quran has, even when the Quran says we, that we is not always God. If you look, I, I, I wrote this reference somewhere, I think it's in Surah Maryam. In Surah Maryam, uh, there is this reference. It says that, yes, in Surah Maryam, verse 85, we will raise the guilty to the Rahman. We will raise the guilty to the Rahman. Nahshurul mujrimuna ila Rahman. Nahshurul mujrimina ila Rahman. We is something, Rahman is something else. Can you see that? And when the revenge was sought from Pharaoh, the verse says, And when they made us hopeless, we sought revenge from them. God doesn't speak like this when they made us hopeless. Okay. Allah is beyond that, right? I mean, by our theological sort of uh, an, an, an understanding. Now, in one verse, there are three points of references. Uh, nay, I take an oath, or I do not take an oath. So I is the first person, God speaking. By the Lord of the Easts and the Wests. So who is the Lord of the East and the West? We are most certainly most capable. So Quran is a speech ordained by God. It is not necessary that God is speaking inside it. And whenever God is speaking, it is not necessary that there's uniformity in the way God is speaking and the notion that God is giving about himself. I mean, if we can read the Quran afresh and mindfully, we will see that, oh, no, it's nothing like what we have presumed it to be. Uh, I, I think I've taken too long, haven't I? No, incredible. That, that was a really amazing answer. Thank you so much. Um, we do have a question here from Nadim. Um, who's asking, uh, most of the Muslim community don't understand the meaning of Quran while recitation. Are we still going to get the sawab of reading? Everyone is reading Quran in Ramadan. So when we look at the Quran and the meaning of sawab, sawab means becoming enlightened. So if a person reads it in Arabic and becomes enlightened and purified in the soul and more virtues, then they've got the sawab immediately. If somebody does it ceremonially, it doesn't mean much to them, then obviously the sawab has been lost. And maybe they need to understand what they are reading and for it to then impact their outlook and attitude and their um, 
uh, morality and God centricity. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not sure if there's any other questions from anyone. We do have a couple more minutes to go. Um, I don't see anything here. Um, we'll just wait, give it, people a few more minutes to see if they have anything to ask. Uh, in the meantime, Sheikh, I did have a question for you. A little bit um, uh, uh, off topic, but I guess relevant, um, relevant um, for the group here mm -hmm. is that, um, you know, taking an existential approach, uh, when we pray Salah and are in conversation with God, it's our individual prayer, but we say, guide us on the right path. So we are forced to think beyond ourselves. Allah wants us to think about the collective. So for the Concordia Forum, where it's a network of incredible people who've come together for global social change, how do we reconcile the collective versus the individual? It's amazing. The Quran states that we have created you from one soul and from it we made its pair, i.e. in a bodily fashion. And from them we have spread many men and women. So the human reality, despite there being eight billion, is one truth. It's one soul gaining from itself through different contexts. And the eschatology, the eventual end that God wants, is the success of the whole human community. If God has imbued us with his nature, then I'll ask you something. The success of a country, is it by majority being in prisons or majority being noble citizens and a minority being prisons who are then rectified and bring and reintroduced within the community? Of course, the majority. The success of a university is gauged by the majority of its pass rate. Similarly, the nature of God, the success story for God is in the collective humanity evolving and graduating. The angels did challenge God and they did say, this one is going to be a misadventure and a failure. And God said, I know what you know not. I have full confidence that at the end of the day, he will get it right, i.e. his progeny. And the literature that we have, eschatological literature, it says that when Mahdi and Isa will come, you will have a pluralistic society. Christians, Jews, Muslims, all of them coexisting harmoniously by their own scriptures, embraced by an overarching and overall system that is conducive to give growth to each and all in accordance with their limitation. So collective is the only reality. The individual reality is quite deceptive. The prophet emphasized the collective well-being. And somebody pressed him for that. So the prophet gave him an example. He said, if we were all on a boat, of course, there were wooden boats back in the day. And somebody in his spot that he has bought and owns legitimately starts making the hole. What would you do? He said, well, I'll stop him. He said, well, it's his spot. He said, I know, but his actions will cause a destruction for the rest of us. The prophet said, such is the nature between the individual and the collective. That the individual is supposed to be subsumed within the collective because the destiny of all affects the destiny of individual and the destiny of individual affects the destiny of all. Now, if you look at every prophet, apart barring two, Nabi Khidr and Yahya, possibly these two, all of the others were social reformers. They did not sit at home, no, <coughs> retreat to their caves. So the Muslim body is called an Ummah. For me, Ummah does not mean collection of Muslims. Ummah means what the Prophet constructed in Medina with its pagan, with its Jews, with its Christians, with its later on Saviour and Zoroastrians. <coughs> Ummah for me means a human community. Awesome, thank you. Um, we actually have a few more questions here, but we're also running out of time. So with uh, your permission and um, for Hatim, Randa, Shajil, and Paul, if you don't mind, um, we can take your questions offline for Sheikh to answer. Um, there is one here, um, if you don't mind, Sheikh, uh, um, from Farina. Um, she's saying, um, isn't the meaning of the Wab reward rather than enlightenment? My understanding is that there is a separate reward for reading the Quran and also for understanding it. 
So if you can answer that, and I believe Uncle Kalfan from New York wanted to, to say a, a word or two as well. So then inshallah we can wrap up. So, so if you look at the Quran, the Quran will say, this is the reward you have earned. This is the punishment that you have earned. What it means is that existentially, existentially, we either evolve and become godlike, or existentially we become regressive. We then manifest our own self in the form of paradise. There is a paradise, but our reception of paradise is contingent to what we are within. And there is a hell, but our reception to hell is it's like two people being thrown inside the dungeon. It's the same dungeon, but they will have two different experiences. Two people going to an opera. One is accustomed, fine-tuned to listening to music and opera. The other one doesn't understand it. They have two different experiences. So reward is not like getting a, a present and a packet of sweets. Reward is the completion of godly light. As the Quran says, Surah Hashar, and hadith that you will see the believers with their light emanating from their foreheads and from their hands and in another surah it says they will plead to allah so allah complete our light for us so there are no back sacks of gold or diamonds being given as reward reward is what you become and you are the eventual creator in the afterlife amazing thank you uh, and with a few seconds left, uh, I'm really sorry about that, Uncle Kalfan, but if you'd like to say anything, uh, the floor is yours, inshallah. Yes, uh, Bismillah Rahman uh, There is a verse in the Quran, Allah say, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. If the Quran was revealed on the mountain, the mountain will split open and bow down to Allah. And Allah says further that He wants me to ponder on the Quran that we just don't read it, but we, we, we understand the meaning and ponder. And number two item, I want to say that the children between the age of three and 11 can learn nine languages and we don't teach them Quran. They neither learn how to read, write and understand, which is, which is very sad thing to do. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much, Sheikh Arif. It's been an enlightening uh, morning here in Toronto, I think afternoon for you in UK. Thank you so much for sharing your, your wisdom and insight with us. Uh, and inshallah, I hope we can keep this conversation going. Um, Zahid, I think I'll pass the floor back to you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Fatima. Uh, great job, by the way. And thank you, uh, Sheikh uh, Arif, for sharing your wisdom for the past hour. Uh, for those of you just joining, again, this is the Distance Socializing Sessions from the Concordia Forum. We're now into our second hour.